Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The Sumner family case. Buried alive. The worst betrayal is the betrayal of a loved one who enjoyed boundless love and trust. However, despite all the pain, bitterness, resentment, and disappointment, many still cope with it and go on with their lives. But what if the betrayal is learned on the deathbed? And the realization of this becomes the last thing that a person experiences in his life. That's what the horrifying story of the Sumner family is about. This case struck to the heart and brought to tears even experienced criminalists with a huge experience, which in their practice have seen everything. Except that the subhumans who committed this heinous crime, despite the initial death sentence passed on them, are still alive and are actively trying to appeal the court's decision. But let's look at this story from the beginning and try to understand how it came to be that a young girl, whom the spouses Sumner loved and cared for as their own daughter, decided to deal with them in the most brutal way. High school sweetheart, James or simply Reggie Sumner and Carol Alford were born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina. They were the same age, knew each other since childhood, went to the same school, and were in the same grade. Over time, their friendship and childhood affection grew into sympathy. School children themselves did not notice how they began to get closer. In 1959, when the teenagers were 15 years old, a romantic relationship between them, and they began dating. Friends noted how beautiful and harmonious it was a couple, and in the home archives of James and Carol later in life, kept their joint photos, where they are young, happy, and ahead as it seemed to them at the time, they are waiting for a long and happy life. For both of them, it was the first time in their lives that their feelings were strong and mutual. The young people were practically inseparable, both in and out of school, and seriously considered getting married as soon as they turned 18. Their parents approved of their children's choice and were not against their marriage, but life had a very different outcome, a long separation. In 1962, the lovers graduated from high school, but they did not have time to get married because a few months later, James was called up for military service in the army. He and Carol decided to postpone the celebration until his return home and also agreed to write each other regular letters. Time passed, the separation dragged on, and in the mid-60s, the young man was sent to a hot spot in Vietnam, after which contact with him was cut off. Carol didn't even know if her lover was alive because he stopped writing to her. Carol decided to continue her studies, at the same time getting a job at the Charleston Air Force Base. A few years later, she married, but the first marriage soon broke up, and the spouses did not have common children. In 1975, the young woman married a second time to a certain Richard Alford, from whom in 1977 gave birth to their only child, a daughter Rhonda. However, the second marriage was also unsuccessful because the spouse abused hot drinks and regularly raised his hand on his wife. Toward the middle of the 80s, Carol could not stand the constant abuse from her husband, took her daughter, and filed for divorce. But Richard did not leave his ex-wife alone and literally pursued her, trying to spoil her life. And in 1987, he succeeded. He bought a handgun with ammunition, and after another reception of a large portion of alcohol, went to the ex-spouse to deal with her. Alfred rang the doorbell, and Carol, unsuspecting, opened it for him. Behind her in the room was ten-year-old Rhonda, but the presence of his daughter did nothing to deter the drunken father, who pulled out a gun and shot Carol several times right in front of the child. He then got into his car, drove to a deserted area, pulled out his gun, and fired the remaining bullet into his temple, dying on the spot. Carol was lucky to survive because the sound of gunshots and the desperate cries of the child were heard by neighbors, who promptly called an ambulance and the police. The young woman was on the verge of death. She lost a lot of blood, and for several days her condition was assessed as critical. She underwent a number of complex operations, blood transfusions, and gradually recovered. Except Carol became completely blind in her right eye and was left disabled for life. Toward the end of the 90s, her health again seriously deteriorated. She did not feel well, noticeably lost weight, suffered from severe pain and weakness. Having undergone a full examination in the hospital, she heard a disappointing diagnosis, liver cancer. 
As it turned out then, in 1987, when doctors were fighting for her life, her body was accidentally carried the hepatitis C virus, which Carol did not suspect and did not treat the disease. As a result, the virus that affected her liver destroyed it for years, leading to cancer. However, thanks to treatment and properly selected supportive therapy, Carol's condition was stabilized. She had to take her prescribed medications daily for the rest of her life, as well as undergo regular medical checkups to make timely adjustments to her treatment. Carol lost her job at the Air Force Base after suffering severe gunshot wounds. Now that cancer was added to her disappointing diagnoses, she was unable to work physically or be on her feet for long periods of time. So Carol took a job as a call center operator for a cable TV company in her hometown of Charleston. As for James, once in Vietnam, he didn't have a chance to report for a long time. The war dragged on, the man was severely wounded, nearly losing his leg, and spent an extended period of time in the hospital. His name was mistakenly included in the lists of the dead, so even his relatives thought that he was no longer alive. Sumner was lucky enough to survive and return home years later. By that time, the connection with Carol was long lost. She had changed her place of residence, married, and also believed that her first lover had died in a hot spot. Soon, James married, but because of the injuries he received in the war, developed diabetes, and a number of other chronic diseases, he was never able to become a father. A few years later, the marriage broke up, and he has lived alone ever since. James took a job as a simple laborer on the local railroad, and no longer expected from life pleasant surprises. The voice sounds painfully familiar. In the fall of 2000, Carol was having a normal workday answering phones and giving advice to customers. When the young woman answered another such call, she heard a familiar voice that sent shivers down her spine. She immediately recognized her first high school love, but she was afraid to make a mistake because she thought James was dead. Carol answered all the customer's questions and then suddenly turned to him, saying his full name. There was silence on the other end of the line, then the man timidly asked how she knew his name. Carol burst into tears in response and replied that she was the girl he had dated in high school that he had once wanted to marry. For the next few minutes, they both just cried into the tube, unable to utter a word. Then they found out that they still lived in their hometown and agreed to meet the next evening, the meeting 38 years later. According to Rhonda's recollection, her mother came home from work that day excited, looking like a lovesick schoolgirl and talking non-stop about James. The next day, Carol prepared for the date, trying on dresses, doing her hair and makeup. Carol realized that she was no longer the young beauty James Sumner remembered her to be, but she wanted to look good and win back the heart of the man she had once been in love with. It was an exciting meeting for both of them, for the couple had not seen each other for 38 years. They talked about everything in the world and could not talk enough, told each other about the joys and sorrows of their lives, about failed marriages, about work, about health problems, and remembered how happy they were once together. Their old feelings flared up again. James and Carol were eager to make up for the lost years. They began to see each other every day, and after just a couple of weeks, they decided to move in together and start living together. Five months later, the couple married, and Carol moved into her husband's home in the Riverland Terrace neighborhood, family life, and troublesome neighbors. The couple first resided in their native Charleston, South Carolina. They were in love, happy, engaged in the arrangement of everyday life, and reverently cared for each other, because both were not old and had health problems. Next to the couple lived the Cole family, with whom James had been acquainted for many years. The head of their family named Stephen had also once fought in Vietnam, was severely wounded, and remained confined to a wheelchair. His wife Natalie disappeared at work, and afterwards did not hurry home at all, preferring to spend time in the company of friends somewhere in the bar. Their daughter Tiffany was left to her own devices from a young age, often hanging around on the street with nothing to do, and no money for even small pocket money. When James and Carol first started living together, Tiffany was still in high school, and good-natured Carol immediately sympathized with the neighbor girl. She genuinely felt sorry for the schoolgirl, who was actually unwanted by her own mother. Carol, for five years in every possible way, patronized Tiffany, invited her to her family lunches and dinners, where delicious food 
periodically bought the girl clothes and even gave money for small expenses. Carol treated her like her own daughter, surrounded her with care and attention. When in 2004, the Sumners decided to sell their car brand, Chevrolet Lumina Minivan, Tiffany asked if she could buy it from them in installments. Since the girl had no money and she needed the car like air, the couple decided to give her the vehicle for next to nothing. The agreed amount was ridiculous, which was divided into a dozen payments and stretched them over a whole year. A forced move and a mysterious disappearance. In early 2005, the Sumners decided to move to the sunny state of Florida. It was a forced measure because the health of both spouses deteriorated markedly and doctors recommended that they move south and closer to the ocean. By that time, they were both retired, so they decided to make a drastic change in their lives. Carol and James sold their spacious home in Charleston and acquired real estate in Jacksonville, the largest and most populous city in Florida. They also purchased a new Lincoln Town car. The couple were extremely happy and settled in a new place, making plans for their future life together. Every day, Carol called her adult daughter, Rhonda, to whom she told her about everything that was going on in her life, shared her thoughts and plans. Therefore, the girl was very surprised and excited when one day, in June 2005, her mother did not call her and did not answer her call. At first, Rhonda chased the bad thoughts away from her and hoped that everything was all right with her mom and her husband and that they would call her back soon. But the next day, the situation was no different. Rhonda called her mother and James's cell phones every half hour, but the phones were now unavailable, and the answering machine on her home phone went off, but all messages went unanswered. On the third day, Rhonda decided to drive herself to another state to see if her mother and stepfather were okay. She left early in the morning and was on the road for about five hours before she reached the Sumner's home. The first thing Rhonda noticed was the absence of a car, but that was only the first oddity. When the girl went to the front door, she found that the door was ajar. The house was quiet and there was a light on in one of the rooms, even though the sun was shining brightly outside. Rhonda called loudly for her mother and James, but there was no answer. Then she went into the kitchen, where she saw a table set for two with food that looked like it had been there for at least three days. It looked as if the owners had gathered for dinner, but had suddenly abandoned the meal and gone somewhere else. In addition, the house itself was a mess with things strewn about and some doors and cupboards left open. It seemed as if something had been searched for, but what was it, and who was it? In the couple's bedroom on the bedside table, there were some medications that were vital to them. There were their mother's cancer pills, which she took three times a day, and a bottle of insulin, which James took by the hour. In addition, the couple's cell phones were completely dead. Rhonda realized that without their medications and cell phones, her mother and stepfather could not leave the house, let alone leave their home for a long time. So she immediately contacted the police to report the incident. Strange imposters. The couple and their car were promptly put on the wanted list, and all bank cards belonging to Carol and James were blocked the same day. The first few days of the search yielded no results and it was not possible to find the Sumners themselves or any witnesses hot on the trail. However, on June 12th, several events occurred at once, which allowed the police to get on the trail of the criminals. First, a man called one of the banks, who introduced himself as Mr. James Sumner, and complained that his card was blocked and he could not withdraw cash. Upon checking the card information, the bank employee immediately suspected something wrong. He offered Mr. Sumner to contact personally the nearest bank branch to settle the problem, but the man simply hung up. At the same time, almost a few minutes later, from the same number, but already in another bank, a woman called from the same bank who introduced herself as Mrs. Carol Sumner and reported a similar problem with the blocking of the card. When offered to come to the bank in person, she categorically refused, saying that she could not do so for health reasons but was in dire need of money right now and asked to return access to her savings, which of course was refused. The information about the calls, as well as the recordings of the phone calls themselves, were immediately handed over to the police. On the same day at the station, they were played to Rhonda, who stated with certainty that the voices did not belong to her mother and stepfather. This was obvious from the beginning because both spouses were in their 60s and the voices sounded too young. 
The police immediately assumed that the imposters are directly related to the disappearance of the Sumners, and they either kidnapped the couple and hold them somewhere forcibly, or killed them, having previously extorted information about bank accounts and cards. The Search A few days later, the missing couple's car was found abandoned on a deserted road in a wooded area. No traces of blood and struggle were found in the cabin, but in the trunk experts found hair and sweat marks, which, as it turned out, belonged to both spouses. It became clear that the owners had been taken away in the trunk of their own car, and there was little chance of finding them alive. When the police checked the couple's bank transactions, it turned out that money had been withdrawn from their cards several times after the Sumners had stopped contacting their daughter. After reviewing the ATM surveillance footage, it was discovered that the money had been withdrawn by a young man who could not be immediately identified. In addition, a request was made to trace all calls from the number from which the imposters called the bank. The SIM card itself, as it turned out, was bought without a contract, with prepaid time, shortly before the disappearance of the spouses. It was not possible to establish the name of the buyer in this case, but it was learned that on June 6th, a call was made from this number to a car rental company. As it turned out, a guest of one of the hotels rented a car brand Mazda RX-8 in the name of Tiffany Cole, and it was on this car later, an unknown young man drove to ATMs where he withdrew money from cards belonging to the Sumners. He withdrew $1,000 from the woman's card and almost $3,000 from her husband's card. Thanks to beacons built into all rental cars to track their location, investigators were able to find out that the already mentioned Mazda RX-8 parked at a hotel in Charleston. There was promptly dispatched a capture team, which literally broke into the room where the attackers were resting, celebrating their impunity. Young thugs. The room was literally littered with packages and receipts from various stores, and among the purchases were clothes, gadgets, video games, cosmetics, perfumes, and a lot of expensive alcohol. Inside was a girl and two guys who were clearly not expecting visitors from the police. They were 23-year-old Tiffany Cole, her 24-year-old boyfriend named Michael J. Jackson, and 19-year-old Alan Lindell Wade. The young men looked surprised, confused, and even scared as handcuffs were snapped on their wrists. All three were taken to the police station and placed in different rooms for questioning, but at first they pretended not to understand what they were accused of or simply remained silent. A search of the room also turned up the Sumner's bank cards, a laptop belonging to the couple, some of Carol's jewelry, James's expensive coin collection, the keys to their Lincoln Town car, and pawn shop receipts in the name of Tiffany Cole. As it turned out, part of the stolen jewelry Mrs. Sumner, Tiffany managed to pawn, and the money spent with friends. After several hours of interrogation, when the irrefutable evidence found in the hotel room was presented, Tiffany was the first to speak. The girl sobbed and claimed that she and her friends had robbed the elderly couple, but did nothing else to them, and then went on the run and started spending other people's money. She also admitted that there was another guy with them, 19-year-old Bruce Kent Nixon, to whom they paid $300 for help and never saw him again. As it turned out, Bruce really agreed to go to the crime for the promised him a fixed amount, and after that he spent all the money on illegal substances, Finding the guy was not difficult because he lived in the same Charleston and did not even think about running or hiding. He was arrested right at his parents' house. A careless phrase and a devious plan. Bruce once realized how the committed crime could turn out for him and therefore agreed to cooperate with the police to avoid the death penalty. What the young criminal told caused horror and frost on the skin. It all began in May 2005 when Tiffany went to the Sumners to give them the next payment for the car bought six months ago. The girl always went to them personally because hospitable Carol and James invited her to stay for a night or a few days, fed her delicious food, and even spoiled her with gifts. If she came with friends, there was always room for them in the house and at the table. This time, Tiffany arrived with her new boyfriend, and both of them were kindly invited to dinner. And since the time was late, the couple stayed overnight at the Sumners house. During the meal, the Sumners talked about how they settled in the new place, and Carol inadvertently mentioned that they had almost $100,000 left after the sale of the house in Charleston, so they could live for themselves in their old age. 
not deny themselves anything, and not worry about anything. With that phrase, Carol effectively sentenced herself and her husband to death. Tiffany and Michael looked at each other, and during the night, while at the couple's house, they began to make plans on how they could get their hands on this impressive sum of money. In the morning, they said goodbye and returned to South Carolina, where in a couple of weeks they found accomplices, distributed the roles and responsibilities of each, and began to realize the plan, the heinous confessions of criminals. On June 6th, Tiffany rented an inconspicuous car, and Bruce and Alan stole four shovels from somewhere. Together they drove to the suburbs of Jacksonville, where they chose a deserted spot in the woods and began digging a deep hole that would become the grave of the Sumner couple. On the morning of July 8th, Tiffany bought rope and duct tape at a hardware store, which she gave to her accomplices. That evening, Bruce and Alan knocked on the door of the prospective victim's home, pretended to need help, and asked to be allowed to make one call from their home phone. Carol thought these young men were strange, but she let them in nonetheless, figuring they really needed help. Once inside, they immediately attacked the defenseless woman and her husband, who came running to her screams, threatening them with a toy gun. The couple's hands and feet were tightly bound with duct tape, blindfolded, and questioned about money and valuables in the house. Under torture and death threats, the couple gave the intruders all the details of their bank accounts and the PIN codes of their cards, hoping that their lives would be spared. But as soon as the bandits received the necessary information, two more people entered the house. They helped drag the couple into the backyard of the house and stuffed them into the trunk of their family car. Driving the Lincoln and in the front seat were Alan and Bruce, and behind them, in a rented Mazda RX-8, were Tiffany and Michael. In case they encountered a police patrol on the way, who would have intended to stop the car with the couple in the trunk, the second car should have diverted their attention to themselves by accelerating sharply or flagrantly breaking the rules. However, there was no one in their path, and both cars made it to the scene unharmed. In the trunk, James managed to free his arm and removed the bandage and duct tape from his face, and also from his wife's face so she wouldn't suffocate, but there was nothing else they had time to do. What was their surprise, bewilderment, and shock when the trunk lid opened, and the couple saw among their captors Tiffany and her boyfriend, who had recently visited them. The Sumners were led several dozen meters through the woods to a grave prepared for them, after which they simply pushed them there. The couple desperately pleaded for their lives, but the young criminals decided otherwise, killing the couple in the most brutal way imaginable, burying them alive. According to Bruce, they covered them with earth for about an hour, and the whole time the bound elderly people cried, confessed their love to each other, and said goodbye. As the examination later showed, the spouses died of suffocation, and in their mouths, respiratory tracts, and even stomach, were found pieces of soil in which they were buried. Having finished their gruesome work, the outlaws abandoned the Lincoln in the woods and returned to town in a rented car. They went to the Sumner house, where they took all the valuable things they could find, and then returned to South Carolina and began to spend the loot. However, after two days, the stolen cards were blocked, and after another four, all participants in the crime were taken into custody, trial and conviction. The only one who from the beginning fully admitted his guilt and agreed to cooperate with the investigation, hoping for leniency, was Bruce Nixon. It was he who showed the burial place of the spouses and told in detail about everything that happened on that terrible night. Tiffany claimed that the initiator of the crime was her boyfriend Michael, who had lost his mind when he heard about the fabulous amount of money that remained with the Sumners after the sale of the house. Her lawyer insisted that the girl was a wingman and was not directly involved in the murder herself. Jackson and Lindell preferred to remain silent, but the collected evidence spoke eloquently for them. The jury did not believe in the innocence of Tiffany Cole because she took part in the development of the criminal plan, rented a car, and came up with a diversionary maneuver if they suddenly chased by the police, helped dig a grave for the spouses, and after renting stolen items in the pawn shop and happy to spend the money. This was evidenced by a lot of photos taken by her in the purchased clothes and in a limousine which the criminals rented to celebrate their success. As a result, Bruce Nixon was sentenced to life imprisonment without the right to ever be released, 
and Jackson, Tiffany, and Lindell were given the death penalty. The criminals filed multiple appeals and grievances, but they were all denied, and the sentence remained unchanged. Except that in 2023, 18 years after their atrocious crime, that very same death sentence was never carried out. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to click on the bell not to miss new stories from around the world. See you soon. Take care.